Supreme Court Justice John Roberts is under fire from conservative lawmakers after recently siding with the court's liberal wing in a decision on church capacity in Nevada. Friday's 5-4 ruling rejected a bid from Calvary Chapel Dayton Valley to block the state from enforcing its cap on attendance at religious services. During the pandemic, a 50-person limit was imposed on places of worship. Meanwhile, casinos and restaurants have been allowed to operate at 50 percent of their normal capacity. Responding to the court's decision on Saturday, Texas Senator Ted Cruz tweeted, quote, John Roberts has abandoned his oath, but on the upside, maybe Nevada churches should set up craps tables. Then they could open. For more analysis, let's go ahead and bring in Kim Whaley. Kim is a CBS News legal analyst, professor of law at the University of Baltimore, and author of What You Need to Know About Voting and Why. Kim, good to have you with us. Talk to us about the lawsuit filed by this Nevada church. What was their argument? Well, they were arguing that a 50 limit capacity in terms of number for churches is discriminatory against churches when other institutions like casinos can have a 50% capacity. So if the 50% capacity, the total capacity is 100 people, for example, a casino could have, uh, or excuse me, 200 people, a casino could have 100 people, whereas churches, regardless of capacity, were capped at 50 people. And so they were saying this violated the First, first Amendment uh, freedom of religion clause because it discriminated on the basis of religion, allowing only 50 total versus 50 percent of total capacity. Do we know why uh, why the state didn't just continue with that same 50 percent capacity? Because if there is a larger building or if there is a smaller building, that matters in terms of social distancing. So you can kind of you can kind of see where the the um, the church was coming from. Do we know anything more about their size or or um, why the state decided to go this way, even before getting into uh, the legal decisions? Well, I think the argument had to do with enforcement, that there are state regulatory enforcement processes for a casino to ensure that they're not over the 50 percent capacity and that it's harder to enforce it with respect to a, a place of worship, um, that uh, you know, state officers aren't going to go into a church and count heads, whereas in a casino, for example, there are video cameras, other ways that the state can make sure to monitor that the institution isn't uh, is complying with with the requirements. Um, in this particular case, we don't have a majority decision. So in terms of what arguments won the day for the majority on behalf of the state, we just don't know. We only have dissenting opinions in this particular case. So let's go ahead and talk about that dissenting opinion. I want to read a partial quote from the dissent that was written by Justice Neil Gorsuch. He wrote, quote, The First Amendment prohibits such obvious discrimination against the exercise of religion. There is no world in which the Constitution permits Nevada to favor Caesar's palace over Calvary Chapel. Uh, as we discussed, businesses in Nevada are currently allowed to host hundreds of people at a time. Uh, how were the justices who ruled against the church able to justify that? And as a, a legal expert, do you agree with their rationale. And, um, and finally, I, I wonder if this decision is final or if this is just the beginning of a larger protracted debate. Okay, so this is the second time the Supreme Court has weighed in on a church-related COVID order. The last one involved churches in California. And in the same 5-4 split, the court refused to intervene and stop California's limitations on churches. The distinction that the dissenting justices made between that case and this case was that there's a rationale um, in the California case that churches, people were all, are going to mingle in churches in ways that uh, the other kinds of ordinances were not uh, implicating. Here, the, the dissenting justices said, listen, you mingle in a casino just like you mingle in a church. There's no basis for that distinction. But there are a couple things, legal things to keep in mind in this moment. Um, one is that there's another line of Supreme Court authority that dates from the early part of the 20th century that was cited in the other, seri the other California case that allows states to make decisions to protect public health. In that case, it had to do with vaccinations. The Supreme Court said that the, the states need to protect the public health can interfere in, first, in uh, constitutional rights. And I think that that's in play here. 
the majority would say, listen, we're not going to interfere as a court with how the states are dealing with the pandemic. It might not be perfect, but it's not up to us. That's number one. Number two, and this gets to your question as to whether this is the end of the road. Uh, this was a request to intervene on what's known as a preliminary injunction. Normally in a case, you're going to have what's called discovery. You develop facts, you get a record together, you might even have a trial. Uh, a preliminary injunction is extraordinary relief. And it essentially says, we think you'll probably win. So even before we go through all that, we are going to give you the relief that you want now. And that's a very high standard. So the majority is essentially saying, listen, maybe there's a First Amendment argument here, but not enough for us to jump in and issue a mandate forcing the state to lift its COVID-related orders with respect to churches. So this will go back to the lower court. The lower court might hold some kind of a trial or a preliminary hearing and, re and decide in a way that's inconsistent with the majority's decision that, listen, on the merits, we are not going to intervene now. A lower court could say, we do think this is an infringement on religion. But all of this stuff is squishy. These are not black and white issues. These are gray, gray areas that courts have to weigh. And I don't think there's an obvious answer to this in the midst of a pandemic, frankly. Uh, very good points, Kim. Uh, I want to also dig in a little bit more into these conservative criticisms of Chief Justice John Roberts. As we mentioned, he's become the target of some Republican lawmakers for siding with the liberal wing on recent cases related not just to public health, but also abortion, immigration, and gay and transgender rights. What do you make of some of these claims? Uh, he's being accused of being a traitor or even a secret, secret liberal. I think that's really unfortunate and damaging to the institution of the United States Supreme Court and the federal courts in general. The framers of the Constitution specifically made the federal courts non-political. These members of any federal uh, court, court serve for life. And under the Constitution, Congress can't sort of dock their pay if they don't come out in ways that the politicians want them to come out. Uh, the justices on the Supreme Court are there to call balls and strikes based on the facts and the law. And as I said, it comes as a surprise to a lot of people, including my students. The Constitution is not black and white. It's mostly gray area. Um, it's kind of like reading an old biblical text or a poem. There's a lot of places for interpretation. Uh, the, the text doesn't answer these issues. So to say that the, the Chief Justice isn't answer isn't resolving this as a politician is true because he's not a politician, he's a judge. But to attack him, I think that undermines the integrity of the court itself. And the, this, the American public needs to buy into the legitimacy of the court as an institution so that we all can abide by those rules. And I just think it's really uh, sort of degrading to democracy itself and the integrity of the court to attack any particular just, justice as politicized. I believe they're all there um, doing the best that they can, although of course they're human beings and they do have political ideologies. But in this moment, I think that the chief justice is caring a lot about the integrity of the court and not becoming a political arm of either Democrats or Republicans. And I think that he's going the right direction in that regard. Well, and the decisions that those justices make uh, live on long after politics have changed. All right, Kim Whaley, thank you for joining us. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you.